Again, our overarching question for the semester is, has the coastal zone become too complex to manage? We saw these before, or at least went through, through most of these. I'll just read them really quickly. Um, this is a quote about the notion of the coast being this inexhaustible resource. And again, this is from 1812, uh, the notion that um, uh, fishing, fish stocks are inexhaustible. Um, 1818, uh, Lord Byron says the same thing uh, more, more poetically, more elegantly, but uh, 10,000 uh, fleets sweep over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin. His control stops at the shore. Again, this vast, uh, you know, huge force that we can't contain is always going to be plentiful, is always going to be stronger than us. Um, uh, Huxley, a uh, famous scientist in 1884, says that the great uh, sea fisheries are inexhaustible. Um, uh, by, by the mid-1900s, in this case 1955, um, there's this beginning to be this notion of we're already beginning to understand that what it has to offer extends beyond the limits of our imagination, that someday men will learn that, this, that in its bounty the sea is inexhaustible. So there's this kind of beginning to continue to talk about this in a more explicit way, but still saying, yeah, we're still cool. We're still cool. And then uh, around that same time, you're getting a different chorus of voices, um, most clearly highlighted by Rachel Carson in her triple book series, or, or her, her, her three book cycle on the coast and ocean. Um, and, and she articulates very well first, and most famously, you guys know her from um, Silent Spring and the fact that we're impacting, um, in that case, uh, with our, with our uh, chemicals that we're generating, are, are inadvertently harming birds and, and other organisms. Um, but here she's sounding the, the call that maybe we're messing with the ocean. And say, and she says, it is a curious situation. The sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. So again, we're not saying that we're going to make the oceans go away as, as, a, as a liquid mass of, of material on this face of this earth. We are saying that we're concerned that our actions are making the um, typical abundance and diversity and, inter and, and functioning of those life systems uh, uh, threatened, degraded, altered, changed from what we've experienced. Um, and then we have the quote here from the Chesapeake Bay fisherman who said, most fishermen think that Mother Nature, Mother Nature brought us fisheries. Um, uh, oh, so, sorry, most fishermen think that Mother Nature brought us these fisheries, took them away, and that Mother Nature will bring them back again. The fishermen think that God brought us the oysters and that God took them away. I think that God brought us the oysters and people took them away. And then my, my favorite quote uh, uh, from Noir about this guy floating on, in Santa Monica. I turned my back and floated, looked up at the sea, nothing around me but the cool, clear Pacific Nothing in my eyes but long blue space. It was as close as I ever got to cleanliness and freedom as far as I ever got from all the people. They jerry-built the beaches from San Diego to the Golden Gate, bulldozed the super highways through the mountains, cut down a thousand years of redwood growth, and built an urban wilderness in the desert. They couldn't touch the ocean. They poured their sewage into it, but it couldn't be tainted. There was nothing wrong with Southern California that a rise in the ocean level wouldn't cure. We're going to be testing that in the coming decades, right? We'll see, see if that's true or not. So again, still this notion of the ocean is very powerful um, and, and, the, and, and exerting control on us versus the other way around. Um, more and more people on this planet, we know this, we're using more and more energy sources and, and, and extracting more and more resources from our planet to support our uh, more billions of people on this planet. Um, all the great, uh, the, the many indicators of the Anthropocene, the era of human signal clearly in the geological record across the planet in many different ways, uh, uh, in terms of uh, atmospheric composition, in terms of deposition of materials into um, material flows, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so let's get specifically to talking about coastal stressors, the kind of stuff that, that we'll be examining um, throughout the rest of the semester. So, uh, I, I'll define for us a coastal stressor is some biotic or abiotic thing. So it could be living, it could be non-living, that constrains some amount of ecological functioning. So some force that is causing a deviation in the background level of whatever. 
uh, plant growth, um, um, diversity maintenance, uh, storm protection, whatever that, whatever your favorite uh, ecological uh, function um, is. We are seeing, we've, we've started to look at this in some of our, our readings and some of our labs and stuff, but we're starting to see a change in the nature, magnitude, and scale of these stressors. So it's, it's also not just that there's another boop, another, another marble on the pile, but actually we're starting to see lots more marbles and, and, and different things that aren't marbles, baseballs and bowling balls and things of that nature. Um, historically, the stressors that we think for, for stuff that happens in the coastal zone, our marine and coastal zone, um, as coming from nature. We still use, uh, I would argue, increasingly incorrectly, the term natural disasters. Right? So a hurricane blasts on in, a volcano blows up, has this impact, you know, an earthquake happens and, and, and causes something, a wildfire, whatever. It's a natural disaster, right? Um, I don't think there's such a thing as or, or there's, very, there's fewer and fewer things that we could properly refer to as natural disasters because the impact of these issues, and it's particularly the case in the coastal zone, the, the consequences of what might start with a lightning bolt or some, some natural cause, vastly complicated because of the choices we've made in and around the coastal zone. And so that impact that might have, so for example, from the, our quiz just a little bit ago, uh, yes, the hurricane would have impacted these homes in North Carolina, say, but um, because of our, our polluting the atmosphere with extra carbon, we're seeing additional impacts from this quote unquote natural disaster. So there's a sort of hybrid of, of, of human sphere and natural sphere that kind of conglomerate together and they're increasingly harder to dissociate. Um, and then another key aspect about the changing nature of our coastal stressors is that the scale is changing and they're, and they're all going up. So, Spatial, how, how wide that impact is over space and how long a duration that impact, uh, the signal from that impact is cl clearly seen over time. So it used to be a little boop boop and the system might, might you know, go back to what it was before. Now it's more like a big huge shove and it doesn't, it doesn't pop back in place as quick um, is the analogy there. And these the changing magnitude of these stressors is getting uh, more and more such that increasingly we're seeing evidence that instead of just pushing on that, that functioning, pushing on that, that system, and the system kind of wobbles for a bit and then goes back to what it is, increasingly there's so much pressure, so much stress that the system, whoop, we shove it and it never pops back. And so we call that moving to an alternative stable state. So the trees all go away or the, the kelp uh, individuals all go away and then we're, we're left with a, a different type of reef for um, maybe for a long, long time kind of issue. So that's what we're trying to uh, understand first so we can respond and, and, and uh, ameliorate or combat or, or minimize these stressors. Okay, so we'll look at some data. So we'll look at just a few examples here. Um, and this is all from your predecessor's data from the opinion polls that you guys are working on. So this is uh, just the last couple years worth of data. It's not, not all the years, just the last few little bit here on this slide. But this is our question. Hey, what's, what's the biggest influence on uh, you know, our coastal resources? And as you guys know, the options are uh, nature alone, humans alone, or both uh, humans and nature or, or not, something else. Uh, I don't know, God or, or magic or some, something else, right? And so when we combine these together, we find that um, more than 90% of our public agrees that humans are at least involved. Maybe not the only driver, but humans are a part of this. So again, when we have these discussions, sometimes, particularly these divisive things in, in the media and things that people want to divide us and, and say, you think this way or you think that way, sometimes people say like, oh my God, you don't understand. Most people do understand, the vast, vast, vast majority of people understand that humans are at least part of what is playing out before us in all these things that we're discussing this semester. Um, right, and then as one we've, we've uh, touched on uh, already as well, uh, we ask about, right, as you guys know, these various things, over harvesting, habitat fragmentation, etc. And uh, this is, uh, 
pretty similar to what we've seen for years and years and years, pretty similar the, to what people started observing w when folks started asking such questions in the 1970s. So this hasn't changed much over time. So um, you guys this semester are doing uh, this guy, the coastal, right? So we're saying, hey, how much of this is a threat to the coastal? In the past, we've also asked this, these questions with, uh, you know, effect on fisheries and effect on coastal wetlands. Um, we don't, obviously this semester we're not asking that, but you guys see the pattern. And so for the fisheries, we also have historically asked about rising sea temperatures and ocean acidification. So those guys are additional colors, but basically uh, the number might squoosh a little bit right, a little bit left, but with this being the highest uh, concern, the greatest threat that people think of to our coastal resources, and on this side of the graph would be the least threatening, this is pretty consistent. So pollution is what everybody thinks of as the big problem. And then these guys are much more closely, the, the other factors are much more closely grouped, and invasive species is always the least concern. Um, yeah. Right, and habitat fragmentation is usually, or slash destruction is usually perceived as um, a greater risk than uh, over harvesting. When we talk about these threats, uh, we could talk about the individual stressor. So that over harvesting, let's say, or that destruction of that chunk of the, of the sand dunes or something of that, and that's an appropriate thing to talk about. Increasingly, as we go forward though, what we're finding is that it's harder and harder to dissociate one of these factors. These things are acting, in, in, and at least in some cases, possibly in the majority, but at least in some cases, these things are acting synergistically. So somebody tell me the definition of synergism or, or synergistic? Kind of. So, yes, yeah, so you guys are both getting close. The idea here is that it's not A plus B. So if, if individual stressor one is killing 100 plants, right, and individual stressor two is killing 100 of a different species of plants, if we just add stressor one and two, we would not see 200 dead plants. Synergism is something else goes on, and we're seeing more than an additive response. So something like we'd see 1,000 dead plants, right? So something, in other words, the impact cannot be predicted if you only study the individual stressor. So the system is behaving as, a, as a, some kind of integrated system. It's not a simple math problem of an A plus a B. So the problem with synergism is you can't really predict them unless you're studying them specifically. And historically, we've, our approach to these various coastal uh, challenges has been to study them individually. Right? I get a grant to study sea level rise. I get a grant to study, I don't know what, uh, a eutrophication of the waterway or something. Right? And then we find out, oh my gosh, if these two things together make it worse than either of them together or combined. So we need to think uh, more uh, in, in, or worry about synergisms more frequently. And then another threat isn't so much the individual stressor per se, it's rather um, our, our management structures how the bureaucracy we bring to these situations and the fact that um, particularly in the coastal zone, if we're all out in the high desert, everybody, it's much easier for folks to agree on what the, what the challenges are and what we're trying to do. It's not, not perfect, there's conflicting stuff there too, but on average, m the majority of the population kind of see the problem similarly. Here in the coastal zone, because we are so concentrated essentially in a two-dimensional and on a line type of area, Everybody is on top of everything, and we oftentimes get not just disagreements, but 180 degree different priorities, right? So some group wants to dump all the nutrients in the water. Some other group wants no nutrients dumped in the water, right? So that is a is sort of a different nature of a stressor and a, and, a, and a significant threat. Cool? All right, some examples. So, um, so uh, we'll talk about individual stressors here, just to make sure we're all on the same page about these things. So over harvesting, pollution, uh, habitat loss or fragmentation, introduced species, and then that, that bureaucracy institutional difficulty. Um, by way of, of clarity for pollution, 
uh, I'm I, I group I'm here grouping for intellectual completeness. I'm grouping climate change into pollution, right? So climate change is, is a some people elevate climate change to its own separate different category of stressor. Um, in this framework, I would suggest it's 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 a huge thing to be sure, but it's an example of us putting too much of stuff out into a place that it doesn't belong. And CO2, uh, greenhouse gases, that kind of stuff. Yeah, Phil. Wouldn't that be like a synergy thing too, though? Oh, of course. Yeah, all these things can be synergistic. Absolutely, okay. totally. Uh, but just for purposes of introducing them, I'm going to introduce them uh, individually. But you're right. Yeah, all these things could potentially, as played out, you could find them. Oh my gosh, they're totally. Uh, getting way worse because of X or because of Y. Cool? Okay. So let's look at over-harvesting here. So I'm going to try to illustrate this with, uh, again, some recent data from your uh, uh, colleagues before you. Uh, okay, so fisheries. So, so, if you, so if you're one of the groups that's going to write your, your public opinion uh, write-up on, on fisheries, right, here's, here's some types of questions you guys could, could ask. Uh, so one is a fishing management. Do people think that our response um, to, uh, to this, this management issue has been uh, good, bad, and different, whatever? Um, and what we find uh, is about a third of people think that, yeah, we're doing, we're doing things about right. Um, about a quarter of the population think that we're not we're not constricting behaviors uh, sufficiently. Um, about 7%, 10 to 7% uh, from year to year uh, think that we're doing too much, that, that we're, we're, we're over, uh, overburdening, over uh, prescribing, over targeting, whatever the fishery uh, issue. And then the vast majority of people, um, or, or not the vast majority, but, but the, the largest category of folks don't know if we're managing our fisheries. And, not, and again, we'll see that as we start looking at the data where um, when we ask these specific management questions, people have clear opinions overall about the stressors and the, and the management actions or whatever, they have opinions. But when we start to get down to, how do you feel about this very specific one, people are less confident in their, in their answers, and we see that here. Uh, when asked the question, uh, so how have our fisheries off of our coast changed since, uh, and we used the 1950s just because that's the sort of start of the post-World War II period, that there's, no, there's nothing specific about the 50s other than it's the wake of that major global conflict um, that introduced, as we'll hear when we get into fisheries, we'll hear that that introduces a bunch of technology, et cetera, that changes the way we, um, and our capacity to exploit uh, fish stocks, both everywhere, but in particular places that we'd not been able to get to before, down deep. Far ocean, far away oceans, etc. And so, um, uh, again, in, in this particular case, uh, a bit more broad, right? A, a broader scale, not not specific. Um, we see people do have a more specific opinion. In this case, about half the people um, feel that our fisheries, the, the quality of our fisheries, have, and the quantity have declined um, since the 1950s. No. Do these these change? Have these changed over time? And would they not, you know, if you're taking an average of the past 11 years, would they not be Yeah, you get, so you guys can look at that. You guys can look at that. Um, the general approach is, uh, remember we have that error, right? We have, and we'll, we'll see what our error is this semester, but it's typically four, five, six percent, somewhere in that order of magnitude. So, um, uh, you, you guys are more than welcome when we get to that stage of your analysis to, to, to hash the data however you'd like. So I'm not, I'm not telling you that you can't do that. But what I'm saying is um, on some of our variables, they don't change from year to year to year. Uh, so these guys that I'm showing you, at least, at least the ones that I'm showing you for this uh, illustration or, or in this lecture here, if I'm grouping multiple years together, it's because they don't significantly differ from year to year. Other variables or other uh, uh, responses do. So there's absolutely some of our variables that really matters what year we asked. I mean, the classic one would be uh, climate change. So that really seems to be driven by the national debate, even though still it's the vast majority of people think that climate change is a serious threat we should deal with. 
the is it is it you know more percentage this year? Is it less percentage? And that usually tends to track with presidential election years, where you have a lot of rhetoric that's being spun up and, and intentional misinformation and, and active lobbying of people to think certain ways. So some variables, yes, it does matter. Others, it's it's pretty solid. And so so that's where the error is coming from here. The error is coming from here. Uh, uh, year one, year two, year three, year four, and that's where, that's where the mean is being calculated from, and that's where the, the variance is being calculated from. Good question, though. Cool? Yes, everybody catatonic now? Nobody's like, what's going on? Okay. Uh, when we ask, uh, yeah, we'll skip, we'll skip that one for now. Okay, so pollution. So, so uh, what, what are people thinking about in terms of pollution? Um, how about our cap and trade? So we're gonna, we'll hear from um, our, our friends in the oil and gas industry uh, in, in a little bit here. Uh, and they'll, they'll tell you some stuff about um, their impressions of, of some of our efforts to, to regulate um, the fossil fuel industry. Uh, but again, this is what people think of. And now, so in this case, we don't ask this question every year. So this is a 2015 and 2017. And again, this is the, the very negative or very positive, et cetera. And we have, even though if you, if, you, if you read the newspaper or watch the news feeds, people are either like, this is the best thing ever, or this is the worst thing ever. Um, about, not quite twice as many people are positive as are, as are negative, but the vast majority of people don't know. So two thirds of the people Aren't, aren't extremely negative, they aren't extremely positive. They're just like, I don't, I don't know about this thing. I don't, I don't think about this thing or I don't encounter this issue routinely enough to really have an opinion about it. Oh, what, is, what is cap and trade? What is cap and trade? Anyone wanna, wanna take that? What, what's our cap and trade <laughs> policy? Or, or, or the idea of it, at least. Right, so cap and trade, um, so, uh, God, a long time ago now, more than 20 years ago, people were talking about um, uh, having a carbon tax to deal with the issue of, of climate change and, and atmospheric pollution and stuff. And there was a big debate, and all the conservative economists said, no, that's horrible. We shouldn't do that. We should use so-called market-based forces as opposed to a tax, even though tax is a market-based force, but, but, but use more of a, of a, of a trading, um, a commodity trading approach. So uh, Senator John McCain and a bunch of uh, conservative thinkers in government said we should have cap and trade. So cap and trade became a big policy push in the 90s on into the early 2000s, and the idea is similar to what we, how we managed um, uh, um, the acidification of our forests on the East Coast, which was primarily coming from people burning, burning co coal with lots of sulfur in it. And that sulfurous cloud, those, those, those toxic clouds were going up in the atmosphere. The wind patterns are blowing into other regions of the country. Then it was raining and it was acidifying the forest, as the, the, the soils, and it was causing pines and other trees to get really stressed out and die and get sick and everything. So to try to deal with that, we said, hey, um, let's, let's have less pollution coming out of these smokestacks. And so the, the guys that built the new power plants were like, yeah, cool, we'll do that. The guys with the old power plants said, whoa, 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 whoa. It's gonna be a gazillion million dollars for me to retrofit my smokestack. And why are you attacking me? And because this is a shared commons resource, our atmosphere or our ocean or whatever, right? Is the goal to have that one guy in that one, uh, one factory not pump out pollution? Or is the goal to have less pollution in the atmosphere overall? And so again, the notion was, well, maybe it's too expensive to have that guy fix his aging power plant. I'm, I'm just saying maybe here. So instead, and if we were to force them to do that, maybe that power plant would shut down. And then maybe those people wouldn't have that, that power, at least in the short term. So the answer is, what if this? What if we just say, hey, dude, that new power plant over there has really reduced their, either they've really reduced their emissions, or for a much cheaper uh, part or, or procedure, they could reduce their emissions further. 
So check it out. Why don't you pay them to do that? And then overall, net overall, we're reducing the amount of gunk you know, blasting out in the atmosphere. In a nutshell, that's, that's what we're talking about. So in other words, we, commod so we, we turn the sulfur or the carbon into a certain value and we give each of these industry uh, uh, plants or, or units or companies or whatever it is um, a certain amount of credits and then those companies can choo choose what they want to do with them. So they can emit up to that limit of credit and be fine, but if they want to take some actions, procedures, uh, equipment, technology, something like that, and reduce their emissions, they can then turn around to somebody and go, hey dude, I got 10 tons of credit. I'll sell it to you, right? So that, so that, that that's so-called um, uh, carbon trading or, or cap and trade. So we cap the amount that we're totally emitting and then over time we're reducing that cap, but we're not requiring any one particular plant to meet X requirement, right? We're, re we're requiring the industry or the sector to reduce. That's in contrast to our traditional management approaches, which you guys know as things like TMDLs and other things, which are a specific concentration in this waterway, regardless of what those other, other 15 rivers are doing, right? So again, this was proposed as um, a response to a carbon tax and so everybody embraced it and then uh, I'll just say some of the folks that proposed it said no I didn't really mean that I don't like that either and so so that's how the debate has unfolded but man but from management wise and policy approach that's what it is we've created a marketplace a, a, a trading marketplace it's like we tra trade pork bellies or something like that in this case we're trading pollution credits or amount of pollution that's our cap-and-trade that was a long explanation, but does that make sense? Um, habitat loss and degradation. Now, uh, I'd say for our class, we typically um, think of sort of the general milieu of the, the, the um, coastal state scrub getting nuked, the soft bottom area getting dredged, that kind of stuff, and then coastal development, just like just like CO2, it's like climate change, people, many people pull outside of the pollution category, but for, for at least initial grouping purposes, I would say sort of general habitat loss and degradation is there. And then coastal development is a pretty specific thing where we're actively putting in infrastructure on the immediate terrestrial, typically terrestrial side of the coastal zone. It does include shallow water, <clears throat> nearshore stuff too with pipelines and piers and such, but primarily we're talking about the terrestrial side of things um, and so so in terms of our questions about um, hey have do you know of wetland and within 50 miles of your house and you know if wetlands gone up down those things people uh, by and large correctly for the most part understand that the amount of wetlands or, or excuse me that, that wetland extent has gone down but they don't correctly get the answer and you guys know the answer i might have told you this before or maybe from dr hartman's class or anything you guys uh so the correct answer is this bin right here so from essentially let's call it statehood or the immediate wake of statehood of california to now it's more than 150 years but but uh We've lost 91% of the existing wetlands that used to be here. So California has the unfortunate distinction of leading the, the U.S. as the state with the greatest proportional loss of wetlands, 91%. So we only have 9% of our wetlands remaining. That 9% isn't kick butt and popping and healthy and great. That 9% is mostly degraded to some, in some form, but this is just gross extent, like, like the, you know, the, the edge of the wetland if we mapped it out. So California leads the nation in the proportion of wetland loss. Do you guys know which, some of you probably do, which state has the greatest quantity of wetland loss? Louisiana. Louisiana, right, Louisiana. So the two places we work. So we work in the greatest proportional loss place and the greatest absolute acreage loss. Uh, place. So yeah, so the correct, so 65, so that's good, close to, you know, two-thirds-ish people understand that we have this fragmentation, this degradation, 
But again, when we get to the specifics, the, the certainty, the, the familiarity is not, is not that much, and that's understandable, right? Most of our public is not studying the extent of wetlands. But it is, it is, it is, in, it is useful, not the fact that people are wrong, but the fact of how many people miss this, right? So one in, less than one in 10 actually understand the magnitude. And that plays out with a lot of our coastal stressors, right? Let's imagine we're having a debate with, you know, reason debate with reason people, uh, and, and we're going back and forth. And if in their head, they think we've lost a small fraction of this resource, and you and I are in a debate about should we enact some policy or, or make some decision to encourage more, in this case, wetlands or, or minimize uh, fragmentation, right? If they're seeing it as, dude, there's a little bit of loss, like why are you having all this bureaucracy and why are you having all these laws and trying to regulate me and the constitution, right? And all that kind of stuff. Versus knowing the reality that it's almost all gone. That, that's, a very, that's, coming at the, that's coming at the problem from a very different perspective, right? And so one of the reasons we do this polling stuff is so that you guys get a better sense of where the general public is coming from. So as you guys go on in your careers and, and work on these things, it, you, um, I think we're maybe a little more sympathetic when we're, we're in a debate if, if we're understanding that most people are coming from this point as opposed to coming from this point of reality, right? And we can use that as a point of, of explanation and to begin our discussions before we start to get to the contentious stuff. Yeah? Okay, introduced species, invasive species, all those kind of guys, good guys. Um, we don't have a huge number of questions about this, but in this case, this is our, this is our, our uh, as you guys are, know now, how we code our data, right? And so, um, a third of the folks didn't know what to, that had, had no idea if pulling off feral uh, critters are bad. Uh, for this, for fall 2016, the last time we asked this, or you guys were asking it this year, but, but fall 2016, last time we, we asked, um, the, the categorization of the score was 1.1, so that was the best thing um, that people thought. So in 2016, they thought the creation of the uh, the Marine Protected Area Network, which we'll talk about later in the class, um, was, was great. So that would be the high. That would be sort of the, the most positive uh, management that people thought. Um, the, the worst of the 2016 options, the worst management option was the 2012 closing of California State Park because we didn't, we didn't have the money. And people thought that was really, 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 really lame. And so that had a relative score of minus 2.4. So the removal of these, of these critters is, um, is fairly high. So the removal of these critters is people are fairly positive um, about that. Um, yeah, right. Institutional effectiveness or institutional ineffectiveness, depending on how you want to uh, phrase it. Um, some of this comes from people wanting to use the resource differently. So overlapping uses. So here's this waterway. I want to put a fish farm in that exact spot. You want to use it as a shipping channel for your, um, for your uh, uh, shipping company, your, your importation um, thing. So that would be an example of different views of what is the appropriate use of that, right? Because we can't both, we can't both, um, uh, we can't have a fish farm there and a ship uh, well, I guess the shipper could go through the fish farm if he's a big enough ship, ship right? He would, he wouldn't, um, yeah, Matt. They have underwater, like, deep sea fish farms, though, like, they sink down to the water table. Yeah, so they're not, they can put them in the pool, they just, like, sink down in the water. Theoretically, we don't have any that work. So we, so there's some that are proposed. We have some grow-up facilities that aren't actually farms that are rather um, wild capture fisheries that we put into cages and then feed them which is different from the traditional farm approach. So people are definitely working on what Matt's talking about, but we don't have anything that's operating at commercial scale at depth. But people are absolutely, uh, investors are actually absolutely trying to see if we can get that working. So you're right. So Matt is saying, well, there's, there's a possible workaround, which is at least in, in the same latitude and longitude, these guys could be overlapping. If we just spread them out on the Z, 
on the depth or the elevation, we could have those guys together. But, but so, right, so what I'm saying is, so one is, one is different view of what we should do there. Let's have a different example. Let's say, um, let's say the beach, maybe this is an easier one. Let's say the beach, right? And so I want there to be beach, beach volleyball courts here so we can have some recreation. People can be healthy, they get some exercise, all that good stuff. And Audubon wants bird nesting sites there, right? So those are incompatible. If we had the beach volleyball, we wouldn't have the nests, right? If we have the nest there, you can't do beach volleyball there. So that's, that's an example of different views of what's appropriate. And, and another, another, and so that, that, that's sort of one category of challenges. The other one is, well, maybe we can have them together. So that would maybe be more an example of what Matt was just talking about. So maybe we could take some, with some application of technology or some scheduling or something, maybe we could, we could use that same, that same spot for multiple purposes. So for example, anybody interested in going to Maui on this year's trip to the Maui Channel, um, you can imagine, hey, here's a spot, maybe during the daytime, we're gonna let people fish here. We're gonna have you know, recreational fishing, maybe tour, tour operations, tourists pay money. The guys go out and they, they put hooks in the water and they fish for fish, let's say, in this spot. And then sun goes down and they go away. And then at nighttime they come out and we put these, these big lights and we attract manta rays in. And we bring in uh, scuba divers, a, a different group of tourists that are, that are just not, not capturing the fish, but just taking pictures of the fish, you know, that kind of thing. So that would be an example of overlapping use. So the, the, the uses are next to each other or maybe even on top of each other, but they don't necessarily impact one another. But if you don't manage them properly, they, they would, right? So if these guys start getting, drinking lots of beer, and say, screw you, and they stay at anchor to the place with their fish hooks in the water, and then the Manta tour boat guys come up, they're like, dude, well, pull your hooks up. And the fishermen are like, screw you, dude, I'm on vacation, right? And then you start to get the conflict. So, so sort of two, two broad categories of something that could potentially work, we just need to manage it well, or just diametrically opposed before we even talk about a uh, uh, compromise kind of thing. Um, and so when we ask people about uh, coastal governing, which we've only started asking the last couple years, um, uh, in California, two thirds of the people think we should be doing more. Um, and and uh, uh, a fraction of people think we're doing too much. Um, and again, with, with over, so th this, this is the level of policy and government and then in aggregate, are we doing a good job of managing our coast, right? Which is one of our, very close to one of our overarching question about is the coast too complex to manage? Um, and uh, about two to one people think uh, that we're doing a poor job and the rest of the people don't know. So a fraction of, uh, less than about one in five, or about one in five people think that we're doing a good job. Everybody else thinks we're not doing a good job or, uh, uh, indifferent or, or, or don't know. And then here's a quick example. So th those are some examples of individual stressors and how the public might perceive some of these individual stressors. Uh, then I just uh, real quickly an example of a synergism, right? Which again, to review, we already mentioned this, but real quickly uh, here, this is, um, let's talk about wetland loss, for example. In this case it comes from New England, but here's, here's an example of uh, how much loss have we had. So in this case, how much loss would we have on this brown bar if we just had sea level rise? That's going to drown some of these plants, right? So our wetlands are comprised of, of angiosperms, so things that live in the air, even though they can handle being underwater, but they've evolved in the air. So they can't be completely underwater for 100% all the time, every time kind of thing. Pickleweed and disticulus and things like that. Uh, so. If we just had this one factor, let's say sea level rise, we lose about 13% of our marshes. Uh, if we have grazing from things like non-native cows and things of that nature in there, we lose a similar amount, about 14% of our extent of uh, wetlands. If, we, if things were not synergistic, if things were so-called additive, we'd expect, by this example, to lose about, about a third of our wetlands, about 27% about according to this model. In reality, uh, this is what we're seeing, right? We're seeing this pressure for all this jazz that, that is, is coming together and much larger than we would predict. 
So a classic example of synergistic combination of stressors. Similarly, uh, this is an example from plankton. Um, and some of these graphs might be a little bit hard for you guys to see in the back, but suffice it to say, this is what happens if we have these different um, uh, environmental conditions. And uh, uh, yeah, basically when we have these things combined, uh, the, the bars are much higher than when they're not. Examples of conflicting coastal priorities, um, they're, they're, they are legion. There's a million things that can lead to these uh, bureaucratic inefficiencies. So uh, competition for resources, first and foremost. So we only have a limited state budget. We only have a limited federal budget. And so this agency, this, this sector gets $100 million, and that's it. So we have maybe this group that's doing safety, this group that's doing enforcement, this group that's doing whatever, and they have to uh, you know, fight for um, uh, who's getting their resources. And so then as a consequence, we can't have we don't have a balance of the um, enforcement, let's say, or the management action. Uh, also, of course, first and foremost, we have this competition for coastal, for just space, right? Again, the linear nature of the coastal zone concentrates everybody. All the Malibu folks want their houses overlooking the ocean, right? All the tourists want to go put their towel on the beach sand uh, right at the edge of the ocean, that type of stuff. Um, and while it's possible, so Matt's example earlier of the shipping and the fish farm that's sunken underwater, in theory, we can have that, right? And, and, and it's possible. Oftentimes, though, in practice, one of these activities harms the other one, right? So there's a wake from the, from the shipping channel and that, that, or from the ship, and that wake messes with the whatever buoy of the fish farm and causes some degradation, right? And so usually, um, uh, there's somebody getting disproportionately harmed. It's usually not an equal, either not neutral or a not reciprocal amount of harm. There's usually one entity that's harming the other. So the classic one there would be something like an oil spill, right? So we're having oil production, and in most cases, things are generally okay. The fishermen can fish, the oil folks can extract their oil. Uh, even if the fishermen sucked out all the fish from the ocean, which we hope they don't, but if they were to, the oil guys would keep on drilling, right? Whereas if the oil guys have an accident and they, they accidentally release all this oil, that's gonna hurt the fishery, right? Maybe not per forever, but it definitely will harm. So usually we have one group uh, adversely affecting the other. Um, and then we get to actual conflicts among agencies. So anybody think of any conflicts out at our research station on Santa Rosa Island in terms of coastal management? People that have been out there? Oh, uh, was that the kind of conflict you were asking? <laughs> no, I'll let that out of the lecture. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, that's uh, different. Different. I, I mean, I mean at the agency level. Yeah, I'll edit that one out too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so that happened. True. That that. Yeah, maybe that would be a good example. But uh, but there's there's another uh, more. Park. Yes. Yes, you guys are saying all good ones. Um, I, don't you hate it when the professor like, says something he wants you to say, and then you're like, Jesus, do what? Just tell us. So, okay, I'll just tell you. So, <laughs> National Park, Channel Islands National Park, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So, uh, there's some overlap and some disagreement as to who control, uh, at, at the edge of, uh, so the sanctuary doesn't control the land, right? We all agree on that. The Park Service, doesn't control the open ocean, but that coastal zone, there's, there's always this constant, dude, you didn't ask me. And the other guy's like, well, you didn't ask me, right? And so, so there's, there's some conflict as to who's in charge in that case. Now, in this case, in theory, right, both are interested in, in resource protection. So, so neither one of those guys is probably gonna propose a massive oil rig inside that area. Uh, but when we have something like the, well, we used to have a thing called the Minerals Management Service, as we'll hear about later when we talk about oil and things like that. Um, we have two agencies now, but, 
But uh, for a while, we had just one. Before the Deepwater Horizon, we had one called the Minerals Management Service. And that was in charge of both safety and putting out to bid oil and gas leases. So this one agency was kind of doing uh, encouragement of development and safety, don't do that because that might cause a problem. Right? So inside one agency, we even uh, could see that conflict. And then, of course, just the conflicting values. What, what, do we, what do we consider is worth protecting? What do we consider is uh, a valuable uh, area or a valuable resource?